If you've written any Rust, you've probably used these data types. If you haven't written any Rust, it's probably these data types that stopped you. If you've used those, maybe you've wondered why you never used these. Do they even exist? Why are they so neglected? We'll get to that, but first let's set the stage by talking about arrays and slices. In Rust, we define an array like this. So in the type for this variable, we have some square brackets, and then we have the data type that the array is gonna hold on the left, and then a semicolon, and then the size of that array. The distinguishing characteristic of arrays is that their size must be known at compile time. In this case, that's five elements. A slice is kind of like an array, but it doesn't have a size associated with it. So the type declaration looks like this. Square brackets, and then the type, but I omit the size. Okay, we have an error here, what's going on? The size for values of type i32 cannot be known at compilation time. The trait size is not implemented for square bracket i32. Okay, what does this mean? In Rust, we can't actually have any local variables where the size of that variable is unknown at compilation time. Another example of this would be a variable with a trait type. So if I were to make this trait up here, and then we get the same issue. The size for values of type sum trait cannot be known at compilation time. Because you can have different implementations of that trait, and each of those implementations can take up a different size in memory. This is why we seldom see slices that aren't borrowed references. So I can change the slice type to a borrowed reference by prefixing with an ampersand, and then I prefix the value it's being assigned to with an ampersand to indicate that we want to borrow that value, and everything's good. Because a borrowed reference takes a known amount of memory, because it's ultimately just a pointer. Another way to handle slices without borrowing a reference is to use smart pointers. So we can do, and this works because box makes sure the contents are stored on the heap instead of the stack. So the size of SLC underscore smart is predictable. It's just gonna be a memory address. Another way to get a slice is to use a range index on an array or another slice. So we can do let SLC two equals R zero to two. So this is gonna grab the first two elements of ARR and put it in SLC2, which is also a slice. One important thing to note here is that it's not actually copying those values. SLC2 is pointing to the original array. So that's pretty efficient in terms of memory and computation time. We sort of did this with this array reference up here, but you can also convert a borrowed reference to an array to a slice automatically. So that looks like so that's gonna grab the entire array and put it into slice SLC3, which although it's a slice, it's gonna contain the whole array. So just to recap, arrays have a size that's known at compilation time. Slices also have a size, but it's not known at compilation time necessarily. Okay, now that we know about arrays and slices, let's look at strings. Under the hood, string is actually just a struct that has a vector of unsigned bytes. And I can create a string like this. A string slice is actually a slice of unsigned bytes denoted by str. And str is an intrinsic language feature, but under the hood, it's just a slice of unsigned bytes. So we can make a slice like this. And then I mentioned under the hood, it's just doing something like this. Strings in Rust are actually different from other languages in that they're mutable. That's unlike Java and JavaScript where strings are immutable, and if you want to make a change to them, you have to make a new string. In fact, Rust strings are a lot more like a Java string builder than a Java string. I can make it an empty string with a very specific capacity, so even though the string is empty, it'll allocate the memory to accommodate the capacity that I specify. And then once the string is created, I can actually mutate it. So let's make this mutable, and then Call pushter. Go ahead and run that. Okay, that worked. So when I create that string, it created a vector of size 10, even though it didn't actually have any contents yet. And then when I added my characters, it could do so efficiently because that memory was already allocated. But what if we don't want a mutable string? What if we want something more like an immutable string like in Java or JavaScript? For that, there's string slices. So we can use a range index into B string and get a borrowed reference of that slice and assign it to stir slice. And that's very similar to what we did up here with the i32 arrays. The important thing to note is that when we're doing this, it's not actually creating a copy of the first three characters of the string. The string slice is referring to the first three characters of the existing string that we created. So kind of like when I was talking about the i32 slice, it's pretty efficient in that sense. Here's the part that can really clear up some of the confusion that you might face. Because string implements the deref trait with a string slice type, you can automatically convert a borrowed string reference to a string slice. 
So that's pretty convenient because when I need a string slice, I can just put an ampersand in front of the string and that's all I need to do. Okay, now that we have all that, it's time to adjust the elephant in the room. Why don't we use these types? Why do we never see a borrowed string? And why do we never see a string slice that's not been borrowed? In the case of a borrowed reference to string, the reason you might want to do that is if you still want access to the string functions that string slices don't have. For example, the capacity or the split functions. Let's run that. So we got capacity 10. For string slices, there's really no concept of capacity. So if you want the capacity, you'd want to deal with a borrowed string reference instead of a string slice. So that's a borrowed reference to string. What about a non-borrowed string slice? One of the ways you can use a non-borrowed string slice is if you put it in a smart pointer. So in this case, we're going to use the RC smart pointer. Oh, we got to include that. And that works. So because we have this layer of indirection from RC, so because RC stores its contents on the heap and we know the size of RC at compile time, that's why we don't need the borrowed version of string slice if we wrap it in a smart pointer like RC. If you want more information about Rust smart pointers, check out this video I made up here. I really hope this video was helpful in demystifying arrays and slices in Rust. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.